I'm calling the meeting to order at 7-10, March 23rd, 2023. Thank you all so very much for joining us and participating in these very important community board meetings. Um, and then I would just like to start with a prayer. Uh, Norbert, you wanted to lead us in prayer. And just make sure everybody mutes themselves, please. Norbert, please go ahead. You can lead us in prayer. Our oh, Father, we shout in heaven, Allah be thy name. Father, we are children coming for you once more. First, we want to thank you to wake us up this morning. And Lord, we want to thank you that you are sent that of us to go to work and you bring us back safely. And as we are about to begin our meeting, we pray for every corner in each and every one of us home. That your angel is here to protect and to guide. We pray for our children and grandchildren. You deliver them wherever they are. Bless the cheer and also every member and the board 12. So give us a good night as we plan that our community will be a better community. In just in my prayer, thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Thank you, Norbert. Just thinking of our, our brother, George Torres, as well, sending him a lot of love and prayers as well. Um, and community board members, just wanted to remind you that you must pick up your community board handbook as well as the zoning laws book. Very important that you coordinate with Ursula to pick those up if you already haven't so. There's a few, I sent out an email to everybody about land use trainings. One just passed that Clinton and um, Ms. Claude and I were at. It was super, super uh, informative. And I think you should all partake in that um, for us to get acquainted with that. There's another one happening that our board is offering to you all on April 10th during our land use committee meeting. So just wanted to start with that and then we're gonna go right ahead into the public gallery session. Dr. Burke. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm gonna make this quick. So hello everybody. It's been quite some time since I have uh, partaken in one of these meetings. And so I'm just gonna make this nice and quick. So just to let you know what I've been doing, you know, I know some people want to know what I've been doing. So I've been up to quite a bit. Um, some things I'm gonna say mum's the word on, but I'm coming in because a number of you asked me, um, where have I been and what have I been up to? So one of the things I want to announce to everyone tonight is that uh, my alma mater, the wonderful Hampton University, has invited me to be the keynote speaker at the School of Science Symposium that's taking place on April the 12th and April the 13th of next month. And so, you know, I'm honored to be going to my alma mater after a number of years to be able to tell them about me. So they wanna hear about my career. They, they've said that I've lived an honorable life. They say that I've been an honest man. And, you know, based, I mean, I know some don't agree, but most do. And so, um, you, you know, I would like to think that it's an honor to be able to go and to speak to the community of Hamptonians just to say, you know, not only thank you for the honor, but also to just give them a snapshot of what I've done in my career and to impart knowledge upon um, the students that are coming up that will be graduating this May. So it's kind of sort of a continuation of what I've been doing, you know, service uh, to all. And so I just want to make you guys aware. So that's one of the things uh, that I've been doing uh, since leaving you guys. So on that note, I'm not going to, you know, stay too much longer, but just thank you for the time. Um, I'm well, and I just want you to know um, if you need me, you know how to reach me. Um, and with that, I'm out. So listen, thank you very, very much. You guys take care. And Thank you, Dr. Burke. Well deserved. Thank you for joining us. Okay, um, I see some hand, hands raised. Just to remind everybody um, during the public gallery sessions, you're allowed three minutes, no more than that. Um, Iris Granby. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the opportunity to speak. I uh, wanted to ask a question but I then also want to uh, put it out in regards to the White Plains Road uh, tragedy that we have with the traffic uh, that I would like to invite all the public officials, board members to come and walk White Plains Road on a Wednesday, Thursday, and a Friday. 
just to experience the traffic between the hours of 10 and 1 p.m. so that you can see that this project is not in our best interest. And as the weather is getting warmer, it's getting worse. So that is my uh, pedestal that I'm going to stand on that I would like to invite everybody to come and to walk White Plains Road so they can see it for themselves so that we can get a reversal of this project. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Granby, next is Effie. Good evening, thank you so much for having me. Let me just lower my hand, oh, good. Um, I'm Effie Artizoni from New York City DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. Um, you might know us as the ones that send water bills to property owners. So tonight, I just wanted to do a quick uh, rundown of a new initiative that we have since January 30th, but it's until April 30th. Um, so we hope you take advantage of it. It's called DEP's Amnesty Program. And we know that many New Yorkers um, suffered during the pandemic and many have fallen behind on their water bills. So DEP is offering customers in all tax classes. So that means whether you own a building or a one, two, three family home and you have any amount of water bill debt, you are eligible for this program. Okay, this is DP's amnesty program. It offers customers up to 100% forgiveness on accrued interest, late payment fees on your outstanding water bill debt. So that's very important, whether you own a commercial property, like I mentioned, a building, a one, two, three family home, you have an outstanding water bill, please reach out to the agency. I'm also going to um, enter the information in the chat. And the reason that it's important is because the program is only being offered until April 30th. In addition to DEP's amnesty program, the state is offering their low income water assistance program, which um, has been going on for a while now, and they provide up to $5,000 to assist a property owner with their delinquent water bill account. Um, if anybody needs any additional information, um, they can contact Ursula who reaches out to me and and thank we'll you. Effie. Question, what are the requirements? Um, you have to have an outstanding water bill debt that you have not paid in a while. Um, so there's two programs that I mentioned tonight. The DEP amnesty program is time sensitive. It's till April 30th. Please reach out to the agency directly for that. We understood that, but what are the requirements for that? Is it like income level? Is are there any? Income? You have to right. You have to enter into a payment agreement, and when you enter into the payment agreement, depending on what your debt is and what your financial situation is, it's taken into account, and that's how they they make your payment agreement. Yeah. So Thank for you. everybody, it's a it's different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so if you have any further information, then everyone can reach out to Ursula mm -hmm. and maybe you can put some information in the, in the chat. I think you actually did. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can okay. contact the agency directly at 595-7000-718. We have representatives that can speak to you directly about your accounts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? That would like time for the pub public gallery session. I don't see any other hands raised. Thank Madam you. Chair, you. yeah. Can I just say that that email was sent out by Ursula early about the DEP thing? Great, thank you. If anyone wants to check? Thank you so much. Anyone else? I, I, um, I see Dave. About the, about the um, guy across the street. I'm sorry, everybody has to mute themselves. We have Mr. Dave Ramsey next. Hello, Madam Chair. Thank you for allowing me a, a minute. Um, I'm one of the individuals. Hello? Mr. Dave, we can't hear you. Hello? Hi, Madam Chair. Now we can hear you. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm I'm one of the individuals that run remote control cars at the track at 
Gun Hill Road at the intersection by the Bronx River Boulevard and Gun Hill Road. And I just wanted everyone to know that the track is still open. Um, we do have people that visit from time to time. Um, and it's still a group of individuals that try to come together and have a little bit of fun with these remote control cars there. Um, I met a gentleman yesterday. Um, I think he's a member of the board here. Um, Ted James, I believe his name is. He actually gave me the invite to let everyone know that it's it's a welcome environment that we have there. Um, and we encourage anyone who is interested, just stop by, it's open to the public. Um, and, and if you have a remote control car, you need maybe advice, we're always there, especially like on Sundays, once the weather uh, starts to get warmer, on a Sunday we'll be there. So I just want everyone to know that we're not planning on leaving the track, we would like the track to remain open. And we encourage anyone to stop by and see, you know, the type of activity that we have going on there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Jiria Bennett. Hi, uh, Beatrice, can I just add something to that really quick? Sure, Ted, go ahead. Yes, I, um, that's the, I met with the gentleman yesterday and um, I invited him to this meeting. I also spoke with uh, Mr. Denise Vaughn earlier today. And um, so, um, Mr. Uh, Dave, if you're still on, we would like to invite you to the parks committee meeting, the next one um, in April, and I can make sure that you get that information. I'll get that information out to you okay. as, a follow -up, as a follow up to this. Sounds good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Jiria Bennett. Oh, I, I don't have anything. Okay, Ms. Denise Bond, you had a question? Yeah, no, for Mr. Um, Dave Ramdeen. Um, Mr. Ramdeen, I'm sorry, I'm not on camera. I'm not feeling 100% as you can hear in my voice, but I'm the um, parks chair for community board 12. And like Mr. Jane said, I would like you to in, in, um, come out to our meeting in April. It's a virtual meeting, but I will definitely send you the invite in the uh, chat. I'm putting my email address. So please um, share, please email me so that this way I can be in touch with you, okay? Sounds good, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Dave. Next up, we have Care Skinner. Um, hello, good evening. I just um, understand that as of April 1st, the mayor has um, made a ruling about sanitation and garbage and no longer picking a bolt. So I have a question. Um, how are individuals, um, I understand, supposed to get rid of their bulk, like furniture, mattresses, all of these things that end up um, uh, usually on an assigned day. I live in a a building, a cooperative building, Tilden Towers. So I would like that kind of question answered, please. Thank you, Carla. Do you have any information on that? Well, they're still picking up bulk. You just said we can't put it out early. <clears throat> I, I, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't. I, I have not seen that announcement, but I will follow up with our DSNY contact and um, I, I, I get an update. Okay. Um, Luke, did you have your hand raised? Give me one you second. Have... Hey, I'm sorry. This is Ursula. I don't have anything. Ursula, you went mute. Sorry, I don't have anything about sanitation not picking up bulk. So can you call the office tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. He mentioned it was mentioned somewhat on the news uh, this evening and during our, our community during our board meetings that was mentioned. So that's why I'm bringing it up. Thank you, Karen. Right. Luke, did you have information on that? Your hand is raised. Yes. Thanks. I just uh, wanted to echo Ursula's statement. I haven't heard anything about that. I've been kind of following this. Um, my understanding is, I guess, as well as Cynthia in the chat, they're changing the setup times, but I believe that the, the bulk is still going to be, uh, it's not going to be affected. But, Care, but we really don't, we're going to get that information. But as Luke was saying, all that was presented to our board was that the times were changing. So instead of putting it out, 
uh, anytime before eight. Now that's changing and it's from eight on that we can put it on, but we can get you the information. Um, I see assembly member Dinowitz here. Do you have any information on that by any chance? I want any of that. Hold on one second, Ms. Claude. Uh, the, the only thing I had heard was what you just said that from now on, you have to put your garbage out later. So uh, we can check into that, but uh, I hadn't heard that. Right. Uh, Ms. Kara, we're, we're going to get back to you on that, but from you can see what we've heard is just a change in time of when you can put out garbage, not that they're no longer collecting bulk. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kara. Okay, any other hands up? If not, I will be concluding the public gallery sessions. Okay, Assemblymember Dinowitz, did you want to share? Sure, and as usual, I will be brief because I know you have a long agenda. Uh, I just wanted to report on a few of the things uh, going on in Albany relating to the state budget, which is due by the end of next week. So we, as Democrats uh, in the Assembly, the Assembly Democratic Conference, which is led by your own Assemblyman, if you're east of Barnes Avenue, uh, Speaker Carl Hasty, um, among the issues we're focusing on include health care um, funding. Uh, in fact, I attended a rally yesterday in Albany with 17,000 members of 1199. It was really amazing. They filled up the entire um, hockey mm -hmm. arena uh, in Albany uh, to try to press for more funding for health care for everybody, um, you know, whether it, it relates to nursing homes, hospitals, uh, uh, people who have home care and so on. Uh, but it's really a very big issue that we're focusing on this year. Uh, the governor has... Uh, put in her proposed budget a significant increase in funding for the schools. So I'm very pleased about that. Uh, we're also uh, working to try to expand uh, funding for the MTA. We need to uh, we need to address the issues the MTA is having. We want six minute service, meaning you don't have to wait forever for a bus or a train. We okay. want to Impossible. make sure that the uh, fares don't go up. So there's a number of things we're working on with respect to that. Um, and also we're looking at taxes. Uh, many of us are supporting a, a small increase in taxes on the super wealthy, people who make over $5 million. We believe that'll generate a lot of revenue to pay for some of the things that we're uh, working on. Give us one second, um, Assembly Member Dinowitz. Um, Mr. Javid Bunchen, can you please stop sharing? And can everybody please meet themselves? No problem. Go ahead. Apologies. Okay. Um, I'm going to mention one piece of legislation. I'm, I'm working on a lot of legislation. I'm going to mention one in particular because we had a big uh, rally about that uh, the other day also. One of the biggest problems and complaints that I've been getting are from stores, whether it's a bodega, a grocery store, a supermarket, a CVS. There's been an incredible increase in shoplifting. Sometimes it's like major shoplifting. And so I've, I'm sponsoring a bill, which will, uh, if, if you're can, if you're caught a second time, uh, you will face a stiffer penalty uh, should you be convicted. And the reason why that's important is because a significant percentage of the people engaging in this are people who are doing it not for the first time. You know, repeat repeat offenders basically. So it's become a really big issue, and it's really hurting the bottom line of a lot of our stores. And when we say stores, it's also the people who work in the stores, the people who shop in the stores. Sometimes there's violence. I think we all saw in the news a few days ago about a um, a violent incident which took place in the Allerton area, not far from uh, Board 12. So we're trying to address that issue. And a couple of my colleagues have other uh, pieces of legislation you know, relating to this subject, but we really want to make sure that it's safe for people to shop. We want to make sure that the stores can stay in business and are not victimized. Uh, and even though crime rate, the crime rate, at least for the most serious crimes, are thankfully starting to go down now, the fact is these type of crimes are still, you know, there's still way too much of it. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say is that uh, I guess particularly for people who live in Woodlawn, uh, the city is going to be installing a new traffic light at 240th, East 240th and Vario Avenue. It's sort of on the border of Yonkers with McLean and 1st Street. Uh, so hopefully it'll make that intersection a little safer. And that concludes everything I'd like to say. I could talk about a lot of stuff with the budget, but you don't want me to, so I won't. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. your time and the information. Thank you, Assemblymember. Okay. Um, Mr. Robert Hall, you had something to share? 
Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say to uh, uh, Councilman uh, Denowitz that uh, I'm not making the trip up to Albany with regards to the ERAP program as it lends itself to NYCHA residents, all right? But they are coming up there to formally protest what has happened as far as ERAP is concerned. But one of the things that really I'm very much concerned about is the fact that the trust that NYCHA now has uh, been given the opportunity to present, mm -hmm. this particular trust, NYCHA has up until $10 billion that they can get loans for. And I'm hoping that you substantially decrease that amount really? because of NYCHA's past history. So please take that into account. I rest, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hall. All right, now we're on the elected official reports. Do we have any elected officials here or representatives that would like to share? Hi, um, I'm Sydney. I'm here on behalf of Council Member Denowitz's office. Um, so we are still having uh, mobile office hours. Um, this is about our fourth or fifth week into it. Um, I will uh, paste the schedule in the chat so you guys have it. Um, also, we recently, as you may or may not know, um, co-hosted an info session with Satish Nori from Just Fix, which is a great org organization that basically aims to educate, empower um, tenants on their rights and obligations under the, under the law. Um, this usually is can be a really complex thing, but uh, he did a great job of simplifying the most important information and relaying it in bite-sized pieces. Um, if you want to watch the session, I will also link a recording of that below. Um, and some news from City Hall. I believe Assembly Member Dinowitz um, actually just covered most of it. Um, but one thing I will note is that Council passed legislation addressing education, which Council Member Dinowitz was proud to vote in favor of. Uh, among other things, the legislation requires the Department of Education to distribute ID NYC application forms and information to all students at the beginning of the school year, um, which is a big change. Um, and then I believe Assembly Member Dinowitz also addressed budget feedback form. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, Luke, you have your hands up. Yes, I just wanted to, to note if the assembly member was still on that um, evictions are on the rise, uh, especially since 2021. And I know that assembly member Dinowitz is supporting good cause evictions to create protections for renters. Uh, in, in my zip code 10467, there's one eviction proceeding for every 10 renters. So. It's uh, something that the uh, community is experiencing a lot. And if our uh, city and local city and state reps can support protections for renters, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cynthia. You're next with Council Member Riley's office. Cynthia, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. All right, there we go. Sorry, I don't, <laughs> don't know what just happened there. So, hey, everyone, this is Cynthia from Council Member Riley's office. Uh, just going over the basics. Our office is located at 940 East Gun Hill Road. Our phone number is 718-684-5509. Our email is district12 at council.nyc.gov. And I just wanted to note some community events that we have coming up uh, in the coming weeks. So we have our Ramadan food distribution at Crawford United Methodist Church over on White Plains Road. That'll be Tuesday, March 28th at 10 a.m. We're also going to be having our Women's History event at the Northeast Bronx YMCA, April 1st at 12 p.m. And our Easter celebration on Saturday, April 8th at 11 p.m. Going, going too fast? <laughs> I'm sorry. If you have a comment, though, can you please put it in the chat? We appreciate that. Go ahead, Cynthia. Sorry about that. <laughs> My mind goes a mile a minute. Uh, but the way, best way to stay connected with us is via social media uh, at www.linktr.ee slash CM Kevin C. Riley, just to be able to get some rapid updates. Uh, we do our best to make sure that we 
distribute information. We'll post it on uh, the wall of both of our offices and uh, through newsletters, through community outreach, basically every way that we can. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Patrika Patterson with Speaker Hasty's office. Hi, good night, everyone. Are you guys seeing me? No, we can't see you. Uh, what's happening here? Yeah, I, I don't know what's happening here. Okay. Continue then. Um. All right, so good night, everyone, again. My name is Patrika Patterson Salmon. I am with um, Assemblyman Carl Yates' office, and I just wanted to give some updates as to events that we are hosting. April 8th to, um, well, April 8th, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., we're hosting our game night, and that will be held at the Northeast Bronx YMCA. And then also we have on March 28th, um, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., a food distribution at the Crawford Church. So um, that's all we have um, going on for this month and um, in April. Um, that is solidified. I also put it in the chat. And again, um, we are located at 1446 um, Gunhill Road. Um, everything else is listed in the chat. So I just wanted to um, leave leave that information with you guys tonight. Thank you, Patrika. We were able to see you. Oh, thank you for joining. <laughs> Ronell with Senator Bailey's office. Hi, this is Ronell from State Senator Jamal T. Bailey's office. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay, um, give me one second. Um, can you see me? Yeah. Okay, so um, I have a rundown of some events that we have in our um in our district so Bissell Gardens we are having a Earth Day community cleanup and beautification that's Saturday April 22nd from 12 to 2 p.m. at Bissell Gardens that's 4525 Barnes Avenue if you're interested in partaking um I can put the the link in the chat and also we have a community baby shower that will be at Drysdale Community Center at 177 Dreiser Loop. I could also provide the link in the chat also. Thank you. Thank you, Ronell. Next up, Alexis with um, Bronxboro President Vanessa Gibson's office. Hi, good evening, CB12. Good evening, Chairwoman. Hi. Um, I hope that you're all doing well. I'm always happy to be here with you all. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing. If anyone has ran into any issues as far as uploading attachments to their application, please reach out to me so that uh, we can work together to rectify that issue. Um, I can Alexis, possibly walk you. Hello? Alexis, yeah, you mute. You were muted for a few seconds, so we heard up up until upload documents, but then you went blank. So you may. Oh, want I'm to so that. sorry. I'm so sorry. So if anyone has ran into any issues uploading their attachments for their application, please uh, reach out to me directly so that we can work together um, to get that issue rectified. Um, and also we have a Greek heritage event on March 30th. I'm gonna share the flyer with the board. And as always, I'll be here for the remainder of the meeting and thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Alexis. But we were under the impression that the deadline passed. Has it been extended? People can still no, no, so it, it passed on the 15th, but I know that there were some board members who were up for reappointment that had some issues uploading their documents as far as like an ID um, and other the other requirements. So if you ran into that issue, um, please reach out to me so that I can double check your application and I can make sure that everything is, um, you know, correct. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Of course. Any other elected officials, representatives report? Going once, going twice. Okay, then that wraps up that portion of the agenda. Ursula, you wanted to share a few things for the district manager's report? Hi. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, George says thanks for the prayers. He's home, he's recovering. 
and everything is going well. And the second thing, just to let you guys know, I did send out an email. I did order the fruit basket and it will be delivered tomorrow on behalf of the board members. Thanks guys and have a good night. Thank you, Urs, and thank you for holding it up, not down, holding it up and everything you're doing on the board's behalf. We appreciate you and George. Anytime. Okay, and then we're gonna move on to our presentations portion. John Sanchez with Five Borough Housing. Yes, good evening, Community Board 12, Madam Chair. Um, it's good to be with you all tonight. Um, brief introduction, my name is John Sanchez. I used to be district manager of Bronx Community Board 6 for about five years. And so it's always good to uh, be with community board members and value all of the work that you do. I know it's hard work, but it's important work. I have a short presentation. I'm going to share my screen and talk about the five borough housing movement tonight. Can you all see the screen? Great. So as I mentioned, I'm John Sanchez. I'm executive director of the five borough housing movement. And tonight I'm going to discuss our advocacy around office to residential conversions and changing some state laws that prevent affordable housing from being built. To give background, the five borough housing movement has nonprofits such as the NAACP, business improvement districts, and partners from across the city that wanna see more housing being built. And this effort spurred from the mayor and the governor convening the new New York panel, realizing that people aren't going into the office five days a week anymore. How can we make neighborhoods where people work, live, and play? The city of New York issued its own study in January, determining how feasible is it for offices to convert to housing? What's needed on the state level and what's needed on the city level to make it work? And to give some brief background, the Manhattan office market still hasn't recovered post pandemic. Vacancies are at an all time high. There are several empty spaces in Manhattan. And this is where we think this can help address the housing crisis. We understand there's a housing crisis. Cities across the country are building much more housing than New York. 200,000 black New Yorkers left the city in the past two decades. And they've gone to cities like Houston, Dallas, and Atlanta, where there's a lower cost of living and more housing being built. And also, where housing is produced in New York is unequal. This chart shows that 10 community boards account for nearly half of the new housing that's been produced in the city. Ideally, we'd have a pie chart where every community board had a sliver of the pie, instead of relying on just 10 community boards. And this is even more pronounced when it comes to affordable housing. You'll see thousands of affordable units are being built in the Bronx, but in neighborhoods south of 96th Street in Manhattan, they haven't kept up at the same pace. A little known fact is that the North Shore of Staten Island has actually built more affordable housing than Midtown East. We don't think that's a sustainable way to address the affordable housing crisis. So here's what we're advocating for. We wanna change state law to allow more offices to be able to convert to housing if they so choose. We want to change the 1961 law that prevents New York City from building more affordable housing. And we wanna make sure that if there are office conversions, that there's a tax incentive for permanently affordable units. Right now, the state law is very confusing. Buildings built before 1961, they can convert to residential. Buildings built between 1961 and 1977 can only convert if they're in Lower Manhattan, south of Murray Street. And buildings built after 1977 can't convert to residential, even if they're completely empty. What we're supportive of and what the city's recommending is that there be a standard threshold. If a building's built before 1990, it has the option to convert, not a mandate, just the option. In terms of the type of offices that will convert, it really depends on the size and how the windows are. Type one buildings, these are more likely to be seen in Soho, Tribeca. Type two and type three, these are the type of buildings you're likely to see in Grand Central or Times Square. In terms of the Bronx, the area that's most likely to, to seize the opportunity to convert is the South Bronx hub area near 3rd Avenue, 149th Street. These are two examples of conversions that have already happened. This first building's on 25th and 5th Avenue. The second one is in Water Street near the Financial District. 
we think both type of offices would convert if they're given the option. And the good thing is that the state has done a similar program like this. Around 1995 to 2006, the city had the 421G program to revitalize Lower Manhattan. And it was successful. It produced around 13,000 apartments, 9,600 were rentals, 3,200 were condos. The big difference is that this program had no affordability. It was all market rate. We're advocating for a new program that would have permanent affordability, even when the tax incentive is over. And we think that this new program could produce 20,000 units in a decade. Most of these office conversions would be in Manhattan, South of 96th Street. But there would be pockets in the South Bronx, downtown Brooklyn, Jamaica, Queens, and Flushing. And we think in total about 200 buildings would convert. The other thing that we're advocating for is to change the state FAR cap. Right now, there is a 61 year old law that tells New York City, you have a limit in how much apartments you can have per floor in a building. This mostly impacts Manhattan south of 96th Street, where there are very dense buildings, a little bit of downtown Brooklyn, a little bit of Long Island City. New York City is the only city in the entire state that has this restriction from Albany. And it limits affordable housing from being built in neighborhoods that are the wealthiest in the city. This is just a visual showing that buildings can have differing heights and have the same FAR. The FAR cap isn't a height cap. It's really a cap on how many apartments can be on each floor. And I'll show you some examples of buildings right now that exceed the cap. There's about 800 buildings in the entire city that exceed the cap. Half were grandfathered in before 1961. The others were able to do air rights, transfers, things of that nature. But if you see the first example, this building's in the Grand Concourse, these other two buildings in the Upper West Side. And it's important to know that about half of these buildings are less than 20 stories. We understand it probably doesn't make sense to have a dense building near Staten Island or the Rockaways. But it may make sense near Times Square. Right now, the city doesn't have that option because its hands are tied by Albany. And the important thing to know is that if the state lifted the cap tomorrow, nothing would change. The city would still have to go through the ULERT process, community board review, borough president review, et cetera. It just allows the city to determine where does it make sense, where does it not make sense. And I just wanted to touch on the city council right now. The city council issued its priorities for the state budget. They included lifting the FAR cap and allowing an office conversion program. The speaker of the city council wrote an op-ed today stating this exact thing. The city of New York is behind this. This is included in the governor's budget. We want this to be included in the final state budget. Other benefits of this program we understand the MCA hasn't recovered from ridership from the pandemic. If more people are living in these commercial areas, they're more likely to take the train. It'll help boost local businesses and restaurants because people are living in these neighborhoods, not just leaving after 5 p.m. And of course, people from across the five boroughs could work on those construction projects. This last slide just shows some of our partners. We've received letters of support from Bronx Community Board 2, 4, 5, 6, and 9. We would welcome a letter of support from Community Board 12 to join the coalition. We have about eight days until the state budget is passed. We have eight days where we can potentially change 60-year-old laws that prevent housing from being built. And we hope that we can get your support. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, John. I think we have some comments. Uh, Mr. Carl Stricker, do you have any comments or questions? Yes, I have uh, one or two questions if that's okay. okay. The floor is yours. Okay. I have no issue with converting commercial buildings to housing. My issue is if you have a large influx of children, where are they going to go to school? Because most of the areas where these conversions will take place do not have enough schools in the area to support hundreds of additional children. Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch on the office conversions piece first. Um, to your point, there are um, 
not as much schools in these areas. Um, but if the FAR cap was lifted, it would have to go through the rezoning process. And as a lot of you know, when there is a rezoning process, the, the city looks at not only more housing, but they also look at what is the school need, what are the infrastructure improvements, et cetera. That process can't begin if the cap isn't lifted. And also, you know, we're trying to get the state law changed when it comes to city sites and city siting of new schools, that's a city role. Um, it's a little bit distinct from what we're advocating for, but we agree with you. There needs to be comprehensive planning, not only for housing, but schools, supermarkets, et cetera. Um, and we think the city can do that if Albany lets it start that process. Because I know of one building that's uh, built in Lower Manhattan by Frankfurt Street. I think it's 85 stories tall. And part of the agreement for them to build that store, uh, that building that tall was that it had to put a, a K through 12 a school in the building with separate entrances. And it has worked out very well. Because most of the kids that go to the school live in those in that building plus the surrounding area where they had previous conversions. So yes. it has been done. Yes, and I think to your point, the city is also supportive of these offices to convert not only to housing, but also daycares, schools, and other uses. But right now, they can't do that because of the year that they were built or the location that they're in. Yeah, the building I'm talking about was built after 9-11. So, because I was on the law of Manhattan Construction uh, Authority when it was built. I was one of the people dealing with the construction. That's how I know what happened with that building. But it's a good, look, it's a good project. I have no issues. And I'm try, I was trying to figure out in the hub area of the Bronx, most of the office buildings along 149th Street, where, where most of them are, are uh, five or six stories. Are you consider converting them to housing? So right now, they don't even have the option. You know, some building owners, they just want to have the option. Some may not convert because they don't think it's worthwhile or it's too expensive, it's too hard. But there are some buildings in the hub area that are taller, that could convert to housing that are currently empty. Um, so I think it's going to be building by building cases basis. We just want to give them the opportunity to have the option. Right now, they don't have the option. Okay, thank you for your answers. Thank you, Carl. So we have some hands raised and then we will go to, I see some comments in the chat as well. We'll start with Kay Santana. Yeah, um, hello. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cordano. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Okay, fantastic. My question was uh, to Mr. Sanchez. I was looking at these streets, uh, 25th and 5th and uh, something on Central Park West and 166 West 75th Street. That's prime real estate, and you're telling me all that's going to be available, all, all of those buildings are now available through NYCHA, and they're affordable? No, no. That was that slide was highlighting buildings that currently exceed the FAR cap now. Copy. They were built before 1961. So it was just a visual example of buildings that couldn't be built today because of the FAR cap. It had nothing to do with public housing, but... If the FAR cap was lifted, neighborhoods such as the Upper West Side would have to do affordable housing in exchange for the cap being lifted because a rezoning would be triggered. Also, one more, um, Ms. Cordano, if you will. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, how would the affordability be done? In other words, if in fact these buildings do, uh, if we can change that the 61 law to um, yes. um, have the floor area ratio, what yeah, would so, be the incentive? Is there a cash incentive to have me having a building on, say, 76th Street, 125th Street, prime real estate? Why would I want to have yet another, and I don't want to use the word project, but why would I want to have a NYCHA building there if there's no incentive? And coming from a project, I know what project life is. I don't know if any of you do, but uh, what would be the incentive is me owning a building in that area? And uh, to have that building there, what would be the incentive? Is there some type of financial incentive that's not being discussed now on that? Yeah, so I'll start with the office conversions piece first. 
we're advocating for a tax incentive for office conversions to have affordability because to your exact point, without a tax incentive, landlords are going to just do condos and co-ops. Absolutely. And it's a sad case because rental buildings are tax disadvantaged and condos and co-ops are tax advantaged. That's why we're advocating for a tax incentive to have some affordability. In terms of the affordability levels for the office conversions, for a family of three, it would range from incomes of 48000 to about 84000 So a pretty broad range of incomes. Now you're asking about the FAR cap and the potential rezonings that would be triggered. The city has mandatory inclusionary housing as a part of any rezoning. And the income levels can range from 40% AMI to 80% AMI. So okay. a family of three making between 48000 to about 100000 um, and that would be negotiated by the individual council members, but as a part of any rezoning, there would be an affordability requirement that the council member would negotiate for. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Thank you, all. CB12. Thank you, um, Clinton or John. Can you check the chat for me, please? Let me know if there's anything there that we need to um, address. Q, you're next. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sanchez. So just a few questions. Um, you know, I see that, you know, in my brief time in the community board, <clears throat> when uh, coming to the meetings, whenever someone presents something, they always talk about how great it is and, you know, how positive it is. I'm a homeowner and I actually own multiple properties within community board 12. Um, let's speak to how uh, these things may negatively impact the community and uh impact you know um just housing values you know uh historically whenever uh affordable housing uh becomes accessible in certain areas uh you know I i'm not one to like put a stigma on the type of people that go in there because you know we were speaking about people getting evicted uh things are extremely difficult and tough but at the same time uh you know my focus is always going to be on the betterment of the community as a whole, uh, the quality of life for everyone in the community. So can you speak to, you know, the not so great parts of this as well? I want you to speak to, you know, both sides as well, just so everyone is clear on exactly, you know, what may potentially happen. Uh, we hear you on the, the, the tax credits, you know, um, but what could potentially happen on the flip side, um, if you may please, Mr. Sanchez, thank you. Well, on office conversions, there aren't sites in Community Board 12 that are prime for office conversions. In terms of lifting the FAR cap, Community Board 12 also wouldn't be a prime um, location either because the prime locations for lifting the FAR cap are near several subway lines. They're well serviced by transit, employment hubs, et cetera. If the FAR cap is lifted, the city is not going to be looking at CB12. They're going to be looking at Midtown East, Midtown West, South of 96th Street, places that are already dense. Um, so this program actually would help Community Board 12 because we understand Manhattan hasn't done its fair share of affordable housing. When people get priced out of Manhattan, they move up to the Bronx. We think Manhattan doing its fair share helps ease the housing burdens in areas of the Bronx. So office conversions, the Offices that are empty and vacant, it's not in this area of the Bronx. It's really in Midtown East and Midtown West. Business districts in the Bronx have actually improved post pandemic, whether it be Fordham Road or East Tremont, et cetera. So both office conversions and lifting the FAR cap wouldn't result in more housing in the Community Board 12 area. This really is going to impact Manhattan south of 96th Street. Understood. Thank, thank you so much for that, Mr. Sanchez. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Lisa Hayes, you had your hand up or down? I'm not sure. Or was your question? Yeah, asked? I was back and forth. So, but I'll take the right. So, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, Mr. Sanchez. Um, great uh, presentation. I share a lot of the sentiments that other people have stated. I think, though, it is not coming to our community. What comes to my mind, though, is often to the point of the last gentleman, there's often a lot of beautiful promises. And even if we, I do plan on continuing to live in Community Board 12, what does concern me is 
how are we guaranteeing, you know, that there's going to be affordable housing? Um, well, I do understand the gentleman's point about often sometimes it making the community or not making the community better. I still would like to know where's the guarantee. And before you answer, I would say that I did hear what it sounds like is we're going to open the door and it's it's very optimistic, but unfortunately what I've been experiencing being on the community board and on the community is that often sometimes the optimism doesn't fan out to reality. Um, and so I guess that is what I'm concerned about. So if you can speak to that, I would appreciate it. So on the office conversions piece, there is no guarantee that building owners will convert their office. It's very hard to convert an office. It's expensive, takes a long time. Even the 421 G program I mentioned for lower Manhattan, only 98 buildings converted out of thousands. So there's no guarantee that thousands of office buildings will convert. The only thing we can guarantee is if they want a tax incentive, they have to have affordable units. That's a part of the legislation. They cannot get a tax incentive unless they have affordable housing. Could they potentially do market rate? Yes. Some building owners will just do market rate. There's no way to predict how many or how much. That is a risk. When it comes to lifting the FAR cap, that's different. If the FAR cap is lifted because it would trigger a rezoning, affordable housing is guaranteed because the city council passed the MIH legislation. Anytime there is a rezoning, there has to be affordable housing. That's in the legislation. Um, so that one is a guarantee. The office conversions, there is no guarantee. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on. We have Luke, then Alfredo, then Darren. Hey, Mr. Sanchez, thanks so much for presenting. Um, I got a couple questions. One, do you uh, provide presentations on other topics related to housing and affordable housing um, that would be maybe more directly impactful to, you know, those types of issues that we're having in the district? Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are a lot of evictions that are occurring, and part of that is, uh, you know, landlords can find uh, can raise the rent pretty easily for a lot of these market rate housing uh, apartments and it would be great if maybe if your your organization would be able to speak to that and kind of the causes and effects of what building housing do has uh, on the neighborhood um but the one thing i wanted to ask is uh you talked about this mandatory inclusionary housing which is like it sounds really intimidating and I was wondering if you can explain what the difference, what that is and what NYCHA is and whether there's a way to uh, improve. And maybe this is a whole nother conversation, but like um, provide more mandatory inclusionary housing so that there's more guarantee for affordable housing in the district. Yeah, so I'll touch on mandatory inclusionary housing. So right now, the city has a requirement that if there is a rezoning, the developer has to, they have four options that are mandated for affordability. I just put them in the chat. Roughly, you have one option where people need to be making about 47,000 for a family of three. You have another option where families are making 62,000 for a family of three. Then you have one where families are making about 31,000 for a family of three. So there's four different options. And council members can negotiate which option they want as a part of any rezoning. So whenever there's a rezoning, there's going to be affordability mandated. It'll be one of those four options. Public housing is separate. Um, public housing is you know, funded by the federal government, mainly a little bit of state and city government support. Um, rents are based on a, a percentage of the person's income, um, but it is public housing. It's It's separate from you know, nonprofit developments or for-profit developments. Um, so it's completely separate. Um, in terms of, do I do other presentations on housing? I do. I just want to get this budget done first. Uh, I'm happy to speak more about um, other housing struggles. Um, ideally, if we're successful with the state budget, the next big thing we'll be working on that will come to your community board's desk is the citywide text amendment. The city is planning a citywide text amendment early in 2024 trying to change certain rules around the city to allow more housing to be built. And as a part of a citywide text amendment, they have to go to every single community board. It has to go up for a city council vote. 
and then it's either approved or disapproved. Um, so if we're successful on the state level, I'll definitely be back again to talk about the citywide text amendment. Thank you, John. And we do welcome these conversations in our committee meetings, housing, land use, because it affords us the entire um, meeting session. And, you know, as you can tell, we have a lot of questions, concerns, ideas, recommendations. And so we do invite you to come to our committee meetings first. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Alfredo, you're next. What's going on? Uh, I think we took enough time, um, but you, you're looking for a letter of support from us. That's what you're asking for. Yes, I'm seeking a letter of support from community board 12 for this initiative. You got, you said you got a letter of support from what, from which ones already. Bronx community board 2, 4, 5, 6, 9, and Queens community board 2. You're muted Alfredo. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you're you back now. On. We hear you. We hear you. We hear you. Alfredo, do you want to come back, log off and come back? Because we can't hear you. Or you could type it. You can type it as well. Yeah, we're going to give you an opportunity. Put in the chat, to... Put in the chat Alfredo. Put in the chat. I don't know. Just, oh, there just, you are. You're back. Just, oh, we, got you. we got you. We got you. Go ahead. Just proceed. I mean, I cannot hear you guys, but y'all can hear me. Just proceed. Um, I mean, otherwise it's going to take longer to get for me to answer my questions. We can hear you, so go along. Go ahead, rather. No, no, it's going to take too much time. Remember, I do code and zoning reviews, so I know exactly what this gentleman's talking about. But there's some stuff that doesn't really, you know, make too much sense, but I don't want to get into it. So... I think um, maybe another conversation we'll have, but we'll go, we'll go from there. Thank you. Do you want to propose a continued conversation at a committee meeting? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No? Okay. Um, Darren Grant, you're next. Darren Grant. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you, Mr. Sanchez, for your presentation. Um, thank you to the board for, for the time. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, just wanted to give a point for concern in your presentation. Um, although affordable housing, I think, is very important, um, especially in those communities that you're speaking of, um, when you consider looking at your numbers, when you consider a 40% average income for the area, you're talking about someone making less than $40,000 for a family of three. Um, has your program given concern? to other cost of living expenses in those areas, um, food, schools, just being able to function in that community, other than them being able to afford housing, how do those people afford those communities once you place them in those communities? Yeah, great question. And it's come up in some of the other community boards that we've mentioned. You know, part of this has to also involve the city planning for more people moving into these neighborhoods. So that will include, you know, the way it works now, just to give you all context for those that don't know, the city will see, okay, we're estimating to see X thousand people come to this neighborhood in the next two or three years. Here's how much school seat need that we need. Um, so it's really incumbent on the local city council members to advocate for more schools, et cetera. And also for the people on the lower end of the spectrum, the people like the family of three making 31,000, um, they often would qualify for food benefits as well. Um, I think the larger conversation is, okay, well, not every local store will take EBT, et cetera. Um, and that needs to be um, advocated for by the local elected officials, especially if they're realizing, hey, we're getting more people coming into the neighborhood. But we think it's important, the first step, we really need to provide housing in these neighborhoods. These neighborhoods haven't done their fair share of affordable housing. They've been excluded from providing affordable housing. And they're the wealthiest neighborhoods in this city. There are Nitro residents in Lower Manhattan, south of 96th Street. They go to local stores, they make it work. I don't think we should be excluding other people in that income range from living downtown in Manhattan because we know that south of 96th Street, there's a lot of amenities. There are parks, there's job opportunities, there's transit opportunities. People don't have to commute two hours each way to go to work, et cetera. And um, people shouldn't be blocked from living in these neighborhoods just because they're not making six figures. But to your point, I hear the point, and local elected officials in the areas need to fight for more schools and things of that nature as well. So I agree with you. 
Ted? Uh, yes, uh, Beatrice. Um, I was just um, reading one of the questions from the chat and um, someone had asked if it's possible to get a copy of the presentation. Absolutely, I can send it to Ursula. I think she has it, but I can resend it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Robert Hall? Um, this is gonna be difficult for you to get a letter because there are some unanswered questions. And I just want you to know in Community Board 12, two years from now, the only NYCHA development that'll be in existence in Board 12 will be Gun Hill Houses. And that happens to be a development that's surrounded by housing, all right? And they affect the income of a lot of these homeowners. So that being said, um, I know we don't fit this particular radar. However, um, I know what you're looking for. Uh, Mr. Figueroa did mention the zoning aspect. I, is there any way we could table this for so that you can come to a housing meeting and get a little more in depth? Is that possible before your deadline, Mr. Sanchez? Well, the state budget passes in eight days, so um, I can come after you know April April first, but um, I wouldn't be seeking a letter of support at that time anymore. Okay, this is this is kind of sticky. It's kind of hazy. You know, I have a million questions, but I understand in the essence of time. I can't present it now. But um, I understand it's just, it's difficult to guarantee a letter of support based on what's been presented at this particular time. You know, I mean, that that's that's my my opinion. I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a housing chair. However, um, this, this is kind of hazy, it's hazy, all right? You know, I, I rest, I rest. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Sanchez, just so you know, we were expecting you to participate in our committee meetings last month just to avoid this because there is a lot of information to process and absorb. So it does make it difficult for us. Excuse, that's, that was our fault. That was a miscommunication between me, George, and Mr. Sanchez. So uh, that was the officer's fault. But Mr. Chances, Mr. Sanchez, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, we had communicated as well too. Yes, and we were trying to have me go to the committee meeting, but um, yeah. the committee meeting didn't happen. So it I would've... was recommended to come to the full board meeting. Okay. All right, um, Anthony Reed, you're next. Yes, uh, I I just want to touch base on um, just this last minute stuff. I'm really not comfortable with that. You know, the housing chair has a lot of questions. So, uh, Mr. Sanchez, if there's any way you can accommodate him by answering those questions, I, I think that that would be sufficient for us because his questions is, is probably very valid because he, he deals with it more than anybody else. So I think that some kind of way, I think that you should accommodate uh, the housing chair with his questions. I don't know how it can go, but I know you're talking about April 8th and all that, but I think that it gotta be some type of accommodation for him I believe, you know, please. I'm happy to answer all the questions of the board. I'm here. Um, it, uh, Madam Chair, is it possible that we could set something up, uh, I guess next week to satisfy or, this? Would, would, could that be done? Ursula, that would be great if we could. Can you walk us through how we would do that? Ah. Uh. We'd have to get the word out that there'd be a housing committee meeting Right, uh, Ursula. But does, doesn't he need to have a response before? All right. So, please? all right. So, we can set up a housing committee meeting, and he can come. But he couldn't get a letter of support from the board if the housing committee voted on it. Maybe he can just get something from the housing committee, but he couldn't get a letter of support from the full board. Would that suffice, Mr. Sanchez, at least temporarily for you to go to the state? It would suffice temporarily. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. <laughs> All right, in the interest of time, I would suggest this, that we, we set up a, a housing committee meeting next week. All right. Um, I'll do it tomorrow. Okay, and uh, 
We'll see what we can do, Mr. Sanchez. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. And any interested partners on this call would automatically be invited. So please feel free. This is your time to come and ask questions. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that suggestion, Mr. Hall. Okay. Um, Ursula, is your hand still up? No, I'm sorry. I'll put it down now. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? As you heard, we will be setting up a meeting for next week. More information to follow. Um, please reach out to, I'll put my email there as well to Ursula or myself. Um, Mr. Hall, do you want to drop your email there as well too in the chat? Okay, I will. I will. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we move on? Thank you, John, again for coming. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on now to the next portion of our agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of January 26, 2023. Can I get a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion. Can Good I get on. a second? Six on now. Robert Hall. Okay. Anthony first it and uh, Mr. Robert Hall second it. Thank you for that. I'll call the vote. Call the vote. Yes, now we're going to take a roll call for the vote. Judith Benitez, aye. Denise Bond. Aye. Ivan Boris. Aye. Carla Bassati. Aye. Michelle Bromfield. Aye. Victor Burr Brown. Victor Brown. Aye. Deacon Brown. Aye. Norbert Bryan. Aye. Desiree Campbell. Not present. Sadie Campbell. Not present. Joan Clark. Aye. Chris Devone. Not present. Tolene Dickerson. Aye. Kevin Eichelberger. Not present. Alfredo Figueroa. Can you hear me now? Uh, I'm just, you're faint, but are you saying yes? Hi. Right. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I got you. All right. Johnny Goff. Not present. Robert Hall. Aye. Lisa Hayes. Abstain. John Isaac. Aye. James Theodore James. Aye. Keisha Martin. Aye. Lucia Martin, excuse. Shanika Moore. Not present. Clinton Mike. Aye. Carmen Ortiz. Aye. Queenie. Queenie. I heard you. Thank you. Queenie Paniagua. Not present. Anthony Reed. Aye. Sherry Samuels. Aye. Thank you. Carl Stricker. Aye. Benga Sabea. Aye. Luke Zavados. Luke. Luke. Oh. Thank you. Deborah Torado. Aye. 
Deborah Walker. Aye. Ryan Walters. Not present. Estelle Yama. Aye. Beatrice Coronel. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Broomfield. Thank you, Ms. Benitez. Okay, that closes that portion. And now we are going to the financial report, Ms. Dickerson. Yes, good evening, family. Um, everything is exactly the same at $2,625. I have not taken out the money for George's basket yet. So that is the only difference. The letter will be going out to all of you we needed to include some of the new people that will be coming on. Love you madly. Stay safe. Thank you, Ms. Dickerson. Okay, so that wraps up our board meeting for today. I just do want to remind everybody that's here that it is important that you join not just the full board meeting, but the committee meetings. That is where a lot of these matters come um, to play and on, on, on our board to our um for us to be aware of all the things that are happening and passing through this board. So the committees are super important for you to participate, have your questions. And so we have a lot coming up next month. Please be aware. We have our calendar posted on our website so that you know when it takes place. If you have any questions, just please feel free to reach out to Ursula or myself. Um, Mr. Norbert Bryan, you want to wrap up with the prayer? Okay, yeah, thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we can need our mighty compassionate Father as we come before you once more. We want to thank you for being so kind to us so we can talk about what's going on in our community. We put before you our district manager, Josh Torres. We pray that we write his that you will send an angel to protect and to guide his family. We pray also for Ms. Ursula as she continue to take the responsibility. We pray for every corner in that that building at 29th Street, 5101 Laconia. And we pray at this time that you will send it in to protect us, give us a good night's sleep. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray thanks even. Amen and amen. Thank amen. you, Norbert. Amen. Amen. That wraps up our meeting at 822. We close our meeting out. Thank you all. Have a blessed day. I'm sorry, I'm Madam Chair, motion to adjourn. So yes, can we get a motion to close? Um, second. Carl did the first. Mr. Second by. Isaac, second. Second by who? John Isaac. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bless. Hey, uh, good night. Can I just say one Great thing? Great night. Good 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 evening, everyone. Good evening.